name is Sarah Alger. I'm the director of the Russell Museum. So happy to see everyone tonight. If you could indulge me with a show of hands, who has never been to the museum before? Excellent. Welcome. Welcome newcomers and welcome all the repeat visitors as well. Uh, so uh, a couple of museum housekeeping notes first. Uh, so this is our last lecture before the summer. Um, we take July and August uh, off in terms of lectures. Um, and then we will return with a slate of interesting programming during Hub Week, which is going to be the last week of September this year. Um, and I think it's, it's going to be a little bit different in format this year. Um, there will be both some daytime programming and some evening programming, um, both um, in relation to um, the art of talking science um, and also um, the intersection of medicine and art. So I can promise you it's going to be very interesting. Um, registration hasn't opened just yet. However, if you go to hubweek.org and enter your email address, you will be notified when all of those registrations open. So I encourage you to do that. Um, uh, per usual, I'm going to send a clipboard through the audience. If you're not yet a member of our the museum's mailing list, feel free to do so, so you can keep up with us. Um, and just a um, another just sort of practical note um, after. Dr. O'Connell's lecture and the Q&A, he'll be signing his book downstairs, almost immediately, directly below us. So just so you know, to head downstairs after we're done up here. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. O'Connell. He graduated from the University of Notre Dame, and he also has a master's degree in theology from Cambridge University. Uh, he also uh, he graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1982 and completed a residency in internal medicine uh, here at Mass General. Uh, in 1985, he began full-time clinical work with homeless individuals as the founding physician of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program, which today serves more than 12,000 homeless people each year in, uh, at both Boston Medical Center and Mass General and more than 60 shelters and outreach sites here in the city. He's president of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program. He's an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And of course, he is still affiliated with Mass General. So with that, let's welcome Dr. O'Connell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> Every time I, I hear the introduction, I was just talking about it, there was this period, quite a long period between finishing college and getting to medical school that is really the most exciting part of my life that I will talk to you about later on over beer. Um, um, and which my mother never lets me talk about publicly, by the way. Um, anyway, thank you. First of all, I can't, you know, having grown up here for the last 30 some years, it's hard to believe such a beautiful building exists on such a small piece of property. And I can't believe they did that. So this is fabulous and it's really, really wonderful. Um, but what I'd love to do tonight, if it's okay, is to share with you just some of the lessons and some of the, um, you know, some of the failures as well as some of the successes of trying to take care of a relatively itinerant homeless population over the last few years. By the way, a population about which I knew nothing before I started this job, or I knew, I thought I knew something. I used to take care of my clinic, took care of some of the people that were longtime drinkers on Beacon Hill, and I knew them in my clinic, but that was about the extent of what I knew. In fact, I used to send them to Pine Street Inn thinking it was an inn where they had a nice place to stay and et cetera. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, if you can see, this is a picture that I like to start with. Uh, and if any of you have been to talk, heard me speak before, I usually have it somewhere in there. But it's a picture taken of uh, actually 10 men and one woman who's hiding there behind. She's the one person. They, can you see that OK? By the way, should I turn those lights off? You can, you can see it OK? Uh, and. Uh, it's taken, it, it's, it grabbed me, it was taken by a woman whose name is Keisha. Let me just make sure I know how to read this. Let's see, is that one sec? Yeah, it was taken by this woman, whose name is Keisha. And for a very long time, she lived under the Longfellow Bridge right here. Um, she, her claim to fame was uh, she lived up under the bridge over Storrow Drive. I don't know if you ever drive under there, you could climb up under the grip. The, the rafters, you can stay right up on there. It was like a, you could see the cars going under you, and they would put cardboard down and then sleep on that. Um, and her, I'll never forget one day we were 
uh, trying to see what's going on, and the red line was stopped for five hours because it was a fire under the Longfellow Bridge. And she sheepishly admitted that it was a cigarette that they had lit that caused the fire, so that created a big stir. But um, Keisha is now doing really well, is in housing, but this was a picture of her very favorite crew, okay? And this was people that she hung out with. They're all real colorful, really interesting street folks, and they, in the literature, they're referred to as the rough sleepers. These are people who will not go to the shelter for any reason at all. They stay out all year long, and they're really fascinating people. Um, but anyway, these were her friends, and if you look at them all, I don't know how well you can appreciate their faces, but they're young, they're average age at the time. She took the picture, which was in 1999, by the way, late 1999. Um, they were, uh, in their average age, was somewhere around 35 or 36 years old, and I've been, Fascinated by this picture, she took it with a throwaway camera and gave me a copy of it many, many years later. Uh, and what's interesting is because this was 1999, 2000, all of these men and the one woman had insurance here, you know, because this is Massachusetts. And when we started that journey toward universal health insurance in Massachusetts, the first people to get it were the very poor. And all of these folks had mass health, so they all had insurance. And then many of them will recognize that the picture's taken at a park just the other side of that building that we call Mousy Park. It's on the corner of North Anderson and Cambridge Street. And it's literally on the grounds of our hospital here at Mass General. So I thought it was pretty cool. Everybody has insurance. They're pretty close to a pretty good hospital. Um, and they're street folks, pretty young. And if you look, walk by any of them, you'd wonder why aren't they working? What have they done? What's going on? Um, and then the truth is, as we follow these folks very carefully, Five years after that picture was taken, there was only one of them still alive. Okay, and as we've learned more and more about the street population, the people that you will see all the time as you walk by, they have the highest crew mortality rate of virtually any, and not virtually of any subpopulation we know in America. And they live literally on the grounds of our own wonderful academic medical institutions and hospitals, okay? So it's a very interesting dilemma that I thought it took and still take these days kind of a kind of a condemnation of what we do and how do we do it better. And I'll tell you more about that later, but this is Keisha. So I'm not going to tell you too much about the beginning of our program, but I got dragged into this kind of kicking and shoving by Dr. John Potts, who was our chief of medicine back then, and Tom Durant, if many of you may know Dr. Durant. Um, they, uh, you know, the, the short version of this is I got called into the office in March of my senior year. I was planning to become an oncologist. Um, and for those of you who are in medicine, know when you get called into your chief's office at that time, um, the questions are entirely rhetorical. You know, you just say yes if you value your career. And they had been involved with the city of Boston. Mayor Flynn at the time was trying to get a grant from the Robert Johnson Foundation to try to organize care for homeless people around the, uh, the city. And interestingly, back then, the reason was that the emergency rooms were feeling homeless people coming in droves. It was a new wave of homelessness in the early 1980s. We could talk about why, but. Um, and their, the thought was they're coming to the emergency room and they ought to be getting primary and preventive care out there. Why don't we figure out how to get to them rather than have them come so sick to the emergency room? So the city of Boston responded to this Rebel with Johnson Foundation grant. And the foundation required, this has always been an interesting part of our program, that, the, that there be a community of stakeholders involved in organizing and directing the grant. Okay. And this is a, a more recent picture of, uh, not recent, it's about 15 years old now, of our homeless community advisory board, okay, of whom many of them are on our board of directors. We have about six or seven, I think, homeless people on our board of directors. And the mandate from them was, uh, was interesting. They, I, I had, by the way, when I said yes to Dr. Potts and Dr. Duran, I organized all my friends to be volunteers. We were going to set up this whole system of my friends in dermatology, pulmonology, we were going to do this. And um, the homeless folks themselves, led by some of the advocates who we re recognize, like Kip Tiernan, who founded Rosie's Place, she was on our board of directors, fierce, fierce advocate, um, and just a wonderful human being. But they didn't want anything to do with charity. They wanted social justice. And so they would not allow us to use a single volunteer. We had to use only paid full-time people because they thought um, volunteerism was not the charity. And you have to realize that was coming from a world where volunteerism is what you do. Right? That's part of who we are. And indeed, we can now. You know, it, what they were doing was pushing us to the wall to say we want a system that would be con continuous and provide the kind of care that we would all expect for ourselves. So I was 
hugely disappointed to find out that I couldn't do what we had planned on doing, and we had to become uh, exactly what our folks told us to do. And so I went, I finished my residency here, went down to Pine Street Inn. I remember this was from June, you know, June 30th to July 1st. Went down to Pine Street Inn and was trying to figure out what do I do. But one thing I didn't know is that I was good. I had finished training at MGH, and my last job was to be the senior in charge of the uh, intensive care unit. So I figured going to a shelter is going to be a piece of cake. I just took care of the unit. I know what's going on. And I walked into Pine Street and ran into the nurses clinic there. I thought there's some nurses here because the story the story is all about nurses. Are there any nurses? Maybe not. Good. OK. Um, so uh, I have an oldest sister who's a nurse, by the way, and I, I, can, I can say this with a laugh right here. Um, when they look at you severely, that is a severe look. <laughs> um, so I walked into that thing all proud of, you know, I'm done, I'm the first full-time doctor there, they'll be thrilled I'm here. And they sat me down in one of those chairs like Willie is in, um, and let me know that they had been taking care of homeless people for about 15 or 20 years without the help of doctors or hospitals, thank you very much. Um, and then what I had to do is for the first two months I could only soak feet, that was my apprenticeship. Barbara McGinnis was one of the nurses in that, as you may know, I'm in this house, and, and our program is named after Barbara, who became really one of my heroes and mentors. But anyway, what I ended up doing was like the man on this cover, this was a cover of the American Journal of Nursing in September 1985, when the Nurses Clinic was celebrated as the only independently licensed nurses clinic in the country, and I happened to walk in thinking they were a lot of doctors. Right? <laughs> um, but, as it turns out, they did have a doctor, they just wanted to be sure they put us in our place and let us know how we should be working as a team. So just to uh, you know, go past it, I ended up soaking feet for people for about two months before they allowed me to take out my stethoscope or do anything. And I've got tons of stories about that, which I would be happy to share with you, but I'll skip. But, and this is Sheila, one of the nurses. And then I had to learn all these things that I hadn't learned in the hospital that were kind of uh, you know, important if you're going to take care of homeless people, but not at all self-evident to me. So this was a man whose name was Emerigo, and he came in one night, this was in the summer of 1985, and I'm still trying to show the nurses that I'm good, I know what I'm doing. Um, and he said, Doc, I can't swallow my vodka, you've got to do something. Well, I'm not used to that as a first chief complaint. But I was like, <laughs> you know, okay, but I knew it was something bad was going on. And he as I talked to him more, he said he hadn't been able to swallow his foods for a long time, but he could get liquids, in particular his vodka down, and he was okay. It was my first inkling that sometimes when you take care of people living on the edge, it's function that they're interested in. If, they're, if they can still do what needs to be done, they do not come to see you. You, know, you have to go find them. It's only when you can't swallow that they'll go say, um, something's the matter. So I remember um, feeling terrible. It turns out he had a huge esophageal carcinoma cancer, which was way past any treatment that we could have offered him. Um, and all we could do was tell him that, you know, there's not much to do, he probably has a few months to live at most. Um, and I decided I would find him a nursing home so he could die with dignity in a place that um, we would all think good. And so I spent, I'll never forget this, I spent an entire weekend filling out all the paperwork. I went over to the nursing home, filled out the paperwork, and there's tons of things to do then. This is all before computers, right? And got him a bed and was really proud of it. It was in South Boston, right about three blocks from where he grew up. It was right on the waterfront. And I came in on Monday and said, come on, we've got you the bed, brought him over. And I thought I had done the right thing. You know, that was it. So I came back to uh, Pine Street feeling pretty good in myself. And about three nights later, I was walking down the alleyway. And what you don't realize there is when he, had, he couldn't swallow any food, so we had to put a tube into his stomach so he would feed him, we could feed him so he wouldn't die of starvation. And as I'm walking down, he's laughing with all his friends, and he's got the tube that we feed him, and he's pouring his bottle of hot <laughs> And I was like, really kill him. You know, like, what are you doing? And then he read me the riot act about what it was like to be in a nursing home after you lived on the streets and in the community of people that he was used to, where it's chaos and it's, you know, he knew everybody had been at Pine Street for 35 years. That was his community. And I put him in this nursing home where he explained to me everybody was sitting around, staring at the wall, looking at a TV, nobody was talking to one another. He said he couldn't stand it. And so he said, thank you, Doc, but that's not for me. And then he begged us to let him die at Pine Street, which is his home. And this is a picture of Sheila, one of the nurses, who was doing what the nurses did so amazingly. They just did his two feeds every day. We treated him comfort measures only in the hospital, I mean, in the, in the shelter. And he did not, he stayed at the shelter until the night before he died, which was really quite extraordinary for me. And a huge lesson about it, I now had to learn 
that it's what the people we're taking care of want much more than what I understood they wanted. And I can remember thinking, man, that was a... Now this is um, another man who, um, and ironically, if you look at the post of this, this is the man who's in that poster. Uh, but the first time I met him was this night, and the staff at Pine Street in, in, in July of 1985 brought him into the uh, clinic to see me. And this was not the clinical staff, this was just the people out on the floor. And they said, Doc, you know, we know this guy really well, his name is Jack. He just doesn't look right. Um, and I've since learned whenever anybody in the shelter tells you somebody doesn't look right, you just turn the volume on the way out, because it's chaos. When somebody rises above the chaos, it means they look terrible. Okay, so that's the translation. So I was, um, you know, talked to him, and he said, "Doc, I don't know what all the fuss is all about. Just, you know, just examine me, will you, and let me go. I gotta get out of here." Um, and he wanted to go smoke. He's a heavy smoker, and he was also a drinker. And he was very open about that. He was not interested in me telling him about how we should cut down on either. Um, but I was pretty proud of myself. That's Scabies, for those of you who are medical. That's Scabies. He's got. He's also got a, a basal cell cancer in front of his ear. Um, and he's really thin, and he should be eating better, and all that stuff. But I couldn't find anything acute going on. His vital signs were normal. When I examined his lungs, his heart was clearly normal. I examined his lungs in the shelter. I couldn't hear anything at all. Okay. Um, and so I told the, I'm trying to impress everybody about how good I am. I said to the staff at Burnham, and he said, you know, I, I don't know what's going on. He says he's lying. He looks thin. He needs to stop drinking and stop smoking. But I can't find anything acute going on. But if you guys are worried, bring him back tomorrow night, and we'll see him again and see what we can do. Um, and so they brought him back the next night. And this was his x-ray. He had an old x-ray machine at Pine Street. And for those of you who are not medical, you can tell that's very abnormal. But that's tuberculosis. That's cavitary pulmonary tuberculosis, about what the, exactly the way you would see it in a third world country where people have no care. And this man I had examined two nights before and found him to be relatively normal. By the way, for those of you who are doctors here, if you examine that, his lungs, in a shelter, air is moving everywhere, it sounds normal. You don't hear any wheezing, you can't feel any consolidation, <laughs> even though there's a lot of air loss in there. Um, so TB, I learned, you know, I had read it in the books, but I never realized how tricky TB can be to diagnose. But anyway, he became the first case. Remember, now I'm just starting out thinking, coming from the ICU, this is going to be a piece of cake working in the shelter clinic. And I realized this guy is coughing up tuberculosis, has probably been doing this for months at Pine Street when he was on the floor. And Pine Street in those days used to have 500 people sleeping upstairs in the dorms and another 300 people sleeping on the floor. And, you know, there was about that much room between each person. So before um, the year was out, we had 65 cases of active pulmonary tuberculosis in the shelter. Um, and it turns out, just to make things a little more complicated, this was what they call a multi-drug resistant organism. The first one we had seen, and certainly in this area, was resistant to the two most common medicines we used. So everybody needed four medications every day for 18 months. Um, and I'm sitting there with, you know, I was with a nurse practitioner, the caseworker on my team, and that's who we were at that time. And we realized, we can't do this. We are totally overwhelmed. Um, and this is like the third week we started working in the shelter. And so it turns out we had to learn how to work in, not only as a team internally, but in teams with everybody around the city. And it's when we learned to work not only with the nurses, but the city, the city departments of public health, city hall. Um, and interestingly, to get people to take those four medicines every day, we had to get on our bikes and get in and go find everybody. Because almost everybody who got diagnosed with TB when they were in the shelter never went back because they said that's where I get sick. So they'd be out there somewhere. And all we kept thinking about, they were out there coughing TB, and we've got to make sure we treat them before the whole city is infected. Um, and so what we ended up doing, and this is, this is remember, 1985, um, and this is with the help of Barbara and the nurses, we started to realize that even though if you look at the population as a whole, it looks totally chaotic and, and, and crazy. But if you look at any individual person, their lives tended to be pretty regimented. They went to the same place each morning, the same place for lunch. They went to the same bar in the afternoon and then wandered back to Pine Street or wherever they were going to sleep in the early evening. And you could learn the patterns of each one. And surprisingly, we learned, for example, that, at, that there were about three of the people with active pulmonary tuberculosis who stopped by J.J. Foley's bar every afternoon before they went to Pine Street or before they went out to sleep outside. And we convinced the bartender to let us know when they showed, and we actually told the bartender he would give them the medication every afternoon. 
And they had a barber in South Boston who used to have a, a there was a coffee sort of clash around every morning, and four of them, the men who got uh, TB, would show up at that, so he would give them their medicine. So we had this collection of community, what I realize now, sort of community health workers and community <laughs> helping us give the medication to folks, so we had to do that for 18 months. This was actually Mark, who's a caseworker I worked with on my team for years, and Ursula, who was a public health TB nurse, they, would, they were on their bike giving this man the last of the uh, 18 months of dosing, and that's what they would do. They'd find people outside. It was really extraordinary, and all but two people got treated over the over the course of the next 18 to months to two years. Um, and um, for those of you who know Paul Farmer, Paul was was still um, he was not out of medical school yet, but very interested in this. And the way they ended up treating remember this is a TB that's going on a block from Tufts Medical Center, you know, six blocks from here. You know, three blocks from Boston Medical Center, so not exactly in a third world country, but we have to use third world principles to try to take care of it. And so the way we ended up treating it here in Boston was the way Paul then went and treated people in Peru and then later in, um, in uh, Rwanda. So we've learned that there's an awful lot of similarities between taking care of people living in our inner cities and taking care of people who are living essentially excluded from the healthcare system. Uh, and then, so that's TB that hit us in, in July and August. And I'm realizing we're, we're pretty overwhelmed that this was not the easy job that I thought I was going to be getting into. And by the way, I was only going to do it for a year because I was going to go on and do my oncology fellowship, which Dr. Potts had delayed for a year. So, and then the second thing happened, we got asked by the people that put us together to have a, what they call a respite, a medical respite unit. And this is the earliest picture I have of this. This is September of 1985, and we were given 25 beds in the corner of the Lemuel Shattuck shelter. And the goal was to take care of homeless people who are now don't need to be in the hospital, but they're way too sick to be wandering the streets all day, but don't have a home to go to where they could have family and visiting nurses and home health aides. So we set up this little unit, it was 25 beds, and we actually loved it. Um, but I think back now, and this is September of 1985, and if you came to Mass General back then and had cardiac surgery, had open heart surgery or cabbage, your average length of stay in the hospital in 1985 was five, between five and six weeks. Okay, that's how long you would stay. If you had cancer, you would be admitted for a week, a month to have your chemotherapy. And we'd keep you inpatient. If you had a hernia operation, you'd be in the hospital about six or seven days. If you had a gallbladder, it was about 10 days. If you had heart failure, you'd be about 21 days was the average back then. Um, and so we had a relatively easy job, people coming to us after a long time in the hospital. So it was really, we thought it was really easy. Until this man showed up in September, late September 1985. And he came from the hospital because he had, his kidneys had stopped working because he had AIDS. He had the, the HIV nephropathy. And he's on this complicated thing which is called ambulatory dialysis. Doesn't need to be in the hospital anymore, but sure as can be, cannot make it in the shelter. So he came to us. And it was the first person in the homeless community to be diagnosed with AIDS. So we're in the middle of this TB epidemic. By the way, if you're interested, among the 65 people who got TB, no one was immunocompromised. It was not an AIDS-related TB. It was a pre-AIDS thing. And then all of a sudden, we started to get hit with AIDS in the homeless population. And it was unbelievably disturbing. Everybody who was diagnosed was dead within about four to six months. They died horribly of infections we could barely treat. Um, and for those of you who weren't around, we just had no treatment like that. There was literally no treatment. And all we could do was treat these awful opportunistic infections as best we could. And then people died miserably, usually alone, without their families, somewhere in a shelter or somewhere outside, and many times in the back of a car. And I just remember thinking, this is not what I signed up for. It was pretty outrageous. So anyway, that's the context that we started out. And from that, we learned we're only as good as the community we're working in. If we didn't work with the shelters, with the hospitals, with the public health departments, we wouldn't be able to do our job. Um, which was a huge, I started to realize the role of a doctor was to be a real support person inside a team, not leading anything. Okay. And then what it got me really fascinated with was to go back to that original picture was the people that didn't come into our shelter clinics. Because the goal of our program was to get the doctors and nurse practitioners and PAs working in teams with nurses and even though we had the hospital bases, to go deliver care in places where homeless people were. Because if you wait for folks to come to you, it's too late. 
So we had, you know, we went to the shelters, we did soup kitchens, we went to the racetrack where there were people living in Suffolk Downs back then, there were four or five hundred people living in the back farms who worked really hard but could never make it in. So we started doing the clinics everywhere we could. But there was this feisty group of people that never came into any of the shelters or our regular clinics and were living outside. And as we learned, as I was pointing to, they were the people that tended to be dying most frequently and the ones that were hardest to get at. And this was a, you know, you'll, the people you would recognize, they're the ones who make, get the picture in the paper all the time because they're always outside. This is the back of the Boston Public Library back a long time ago when people used to live on the grates. And what we ended up doing was realizing that we had to, for those of you who were Mass General based, we, the only way you could take care of a street population, we realized, was to be like a Bigelow team. Okay, you had to have a group of people who all equally shared in the care of these folks and who, um, you know, were integrated. So this picture I love because it's, uh, many of you will recognize the people in here. But the, on the left is Jim Bonner. He's a full-time psychiatrist. And one of the real blessings we've had from Mass General was that they, Mass General actually, as the London building was getting built, paid for us to have Jim as a full-time psychiatrist on our street team, which was like the most amazing thing that ever happened. He's still on our team. Romy is our community health worker next to him. Many of you may know Dave Munson, who is uh, trained here at MGH, and is now um, the other doctor on it, the other internist on our team. And I'm chagrined to realize that he's less than half my age. Um, and then Suzanne is our nurse practitioner, who, and you know, some of this has changed a little bit, but that's we were all full time. Stephanie was our nurse and myself. And our job was to look at the people living on the street as our patient panel, okay? And we shared fully in the care of them. It's very hard, especially in EMR systems, to let people know that we all share equally. But it is truly like the people like the old video teams where we were all responsible for everything. Um, but it's been the best job I've ever had because it's the only way you can take care of this population. So we work, um, many of you know Pine Street has this remarkable van that goes out every single night of the year from 9 at night till 5 in the morning. It's got funding from the Department of Public Health of Massachusetts. Um, and their job is to go out and just be a contact with people living on the streets. I, um, another, another one of my failures is when they were, when the money was coming out for that, we were arguing that these are the people dying so can we get some service. And when they decided to do a van, I wanted to make it a medical van. And uh, the homeless people that were involved in all this, our homeless group, said, not in your life, because they don't want to see doctors in the middle of the night. They want sandwiches or soup or blankets, you know, something that will keep me warm and keep me practical. So the van is truly, um, and I'll show you, I think I have a picture of the folks there. These are the people that drive the van. And if I were creating a healthcare system, and you know, this goes back a long time, these are the people that are the entryway to it. They are like the classic accompaniment or community health workers. They all have been either close to or experienced homelessness themselves, many of recovery. Um, they work those crazy hours from night at night till five in the morning. They know everybody who's outside. And we get to ride two nights a week on that van and sort of serve sandwiches and then let people know if they need anything. We're also a doctor or a nurse, whatever it is. And it's been our ability, you know, they've been the reason we could follow this group of people. So if you were asking where is somebody on the street tonight, I could call uh, Nelson on the van and say, we're trying to find so-and-so, and they'll call back within an hour and tell you where they are. It's just remarkable, okay? And so when we've done studies, we have much better retention rates on our population than almost anyone else can get. And it's all because of this van. And riding on it is a gas. This was a cold night. Remember, we had the nine feet of snow in six weeks, and it was, there was a northeaster. There were still about 120 people sleeping outside during those really, really bitter cold nights. This is somebody sleeping on Trinity Church. You know, this is right in front of Trinity Church, and that's uh, Cesar, one of the uh, workers. And I threw this picture in there because this was uh, a man we had been following for a long time, and he's Mexican, and he cans all night long. He goes around like many people. And get, that makes his living by gathering cans. It works like crazy it's all night long, six nights a week. As if there's one night when they don't have a collection, um, and he does one part of town on three nights and the other part of town on the other three nights. And he's just the sweetest. He's a tiny little person, sweetest man. And we don't know much of his story. Didn't certainly know much of his story. But you may have uh, read in the paper uh, uh, not long after Donald Trump had his tirade against Mexico. Um, that two two kind of rough guys beat this man up. Okay, you know they peed on him. They did all the stuff that you can imagine homeless people suffer in the worst ways. Um, and it turned out it happened to be 
coincide with that and may happen to mention Donald Trump in this, and he was a Mexican, you know, something like that. But he was front page news in the Mexican newspapers for about a week, you know, as an example of what Mexicans go through in our country and do all that. Um, but the van knew him well, and we had him at our McGinnis house for a long time. He actually had you know, broken sternum. He was really terrible, ribs were broken. But he is now um, back home in Mexico, as far as I know, and he was able to get a housing, but it's a pretty remarkable story. But he lived out by JFK Stadium, that's what we were seeing in there, by J oh, no, excuse, JFK Station near, uh, near um, Savin Hill. And then this is Dave, what we learned with that street stuff. And um, this came, I just to share with you, we had to, I had to shed this kind of concept that you have to see people in the clinic in order to have privacy and do other things you're supposed to do. And our nurse, uh, our nurse practitioner and our physician assistant challenged us, the doctors, about what is it that we do in the exam room that's so sacred it can't be done somewhere else. Okay, and this is particularly for a street population that won't come. So um, we started thinking about that, and it turns out that about 80 or 85% of everything we do in an exam room, you could do at the McDonald's or the South Station, as long as you could sit down and talk to people and have some, a little bit of you know, ear privacy anyway. And this is Dave um, Munson doing sort of street rounds. We have night rounds and then the street rounds during the day. And this is a woman who's 84. She has terrible heart failure. Will not come in to see the doctors, but we can manage her care sort of by doing weights when we see her there and managing her medication. But only at, that's at South Station. She won't let us do it anywhere else. And we learned that you know we can sort of keep her out of the hospital and keep her happy. It's where she wants to be. Um, a little unorthodox, and um, Dave and I were a little bit skeptical that we could really do this, but our nurses said, no, oh, we can. Um, and this is Jim, our psychiatrist, and he's learned that many of the people who stay outside will never go toward anything that says psychiatry or mental health. Okay, they just won't go. And so the advantage of having him on our team is that he's with us wherever we are, but he's learned that this is, this is McDonald's where we're seeing this woman and Katie, and that's where he does a lot of his medication management at McDonald's, because they'll sit with him at a McDonald's. Um, I don't know why it's McDonald's, but it tends to be at McDonald's all the time. Um, I don't know what he's having to sell his soul on, but, um, <laughs> but he's found, he, and he's a really seasoned psychiatrist. He's run mental health centers around the country, worked in New Zealand, and he's had like a renaissance in his life, learning that you could do really interesting psychiatry on the streets for people particularly who will never go in. Um, and for us, it's been remarkable. So if I see somebody who will talk to me about this, so through, I can say if you want to see Jim Bonner here, he'll take care of your voices or whatever else it is. And there's no, you know, you know, he's here with me. You don't have to send him anywhere. It's really the best. Um, it's a great example of it. So this is Pat Perry, who was our, our doctor with us, and, uh, and many years ago, also an NGH grad, uh, with Eileen Riley, who's our other psychiatrist, talking to this man we know as Mickey at um, God. Look at this, it's McDonald's down by, um, <laughs> down by, Mickey works in the open market, I think I have a picture. He works here, this is Mickey with one of, uh, I don't know if you guys know Kerry Oxley, one of the psych residents who was out doing street rounds with us, and Otto on the left runs several of the open market stands downstairs, and Mickey works with them. But anyway, Mickey has a spot on his lung that I've seen on an x-ray that looks like cancer, but we don't know what kind of cancer, we can't treat it until we stick a needle in it and find out what the tissue looks like. Um, and he looked at me like, are you nuts? I you cannot put a needle into my look. He was just very paranoid about all of that, even though I had known him for a long time. But I mean, who's a psychiatrist, um, would sit with us, and Cheryl Kane, who's on the, you can see her on there, is our nurse. We would sit with him and talk it over. He works at the market right there, and we'd sit and have coffee and talk over the options, okay? And it was remarkable. I remember taking this picture because I was so stunned by how Eileen understood his paranoia in a way that we didn't, and we understood what needed to be done. And he finally agreed to have the needle biopsy done. Um, for those of you who are medicine, with it, we had to promise him a lot of benzodiazepines to calm him down. Um, but he agreed to have it done, and he had the biopsy, then ended up going to surgery, and it turned out to be cancer, had no carcinoma, had the surgery taken out. And this picture is now. Uh, that picture was now eight years ago, and this is Mickey now in his housing. And I can't, and that's Jill, our physician assistant, who is visiting him there on one of our home visits. But it, I realized that he, you know, he got treated for something that would have never been treated had we all been working in separate silos. So it, I look at that as my, you know, it, it always reminds me that those of us working together will do a whole lot better if a population vulnerable and excluded populations like this. Um, Atul Gawande was speaking at the Physician <coughs> Assistant Conference not so very long, I think it was about a year ago. 
and he pointed, he sort of dinged us all, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, um, when he said that the physician assistant uh, profession is the only one of the real health line professions that is absolutely dedicated to never working independently. And he said, that's how we should all look, okay? That we should stop thinking we need to practice independently on our licenses, which is how I was trained. I know our nurse practitioners are trained that way. And to think of it in a different shared arrangement. Um, anyway, then the other thing we had to learn was, okay, when you go out to the street, are you just doing first aid and episodic care? You know, are we just putting Band-Aids on, or can we actually do regular care? Um, and uh, Jill and Suzanne, our two, uh, you know, our PA and NP sort of challenged us again about, you know, why aren't we doing regular quality measures? So we've learned, you know, during the fall, everybody who lives on the street, we give them a flu shot. Everybody gets it. Um, at least all those who say yes, and believe it or not, most of the folks as we've got to know them will say yes if we offer it to them. They'll say no if you come into a clinic. And this picture is particularly poignant for me because that's Pat. And Kafoy went, as Jill is giving a shot to this man whose uh, name is John, sitting in the, on the steps of the, or on the bank right outside the Boston Public Library. And Pat had asked this guy about 15 times, can I give you a flu shot? And the guy goes, no way. Um, and then Jill walks up and says, hey, John, can I just give you a shot? And he goes, oh, sure, honey, and puts his arm around the back. <laughs> so this is Pat going, are you kidding me? Um, but it taught us, and I'm sorry, I don't mean that sexist in the way it might have come out there, but it turned out that at the different relationships inside a team can often maneuver things so you get done what you need to get done, but we all need each other. We can't do it alone. Um, and then we also learned, this is a, another sort of remarkable tribute, I think, to MGH, if you don't mind me doing that, but we see an awful lot of people with terrible rashes and terrible frostbite, terrible stuff outside who will not come in. And we learned with the help of Ernesto Gonzalez, who's one of the dermatologists here at MGH, really a, a remarkably wonderful man, that um, if we take a picture of a rash or something, it turns out that about 95% of the time, dermatologists can get an accurate diagnosis of a rash. So this is a man who had been in five emergency rooms uh, with this itchy rash that he thought was scabies. He was treated five different times for scabies, never got better. And we're looking at it, he's now under a bridge. He won't come out, he won't go back to the hospital because he feels doctors are useless. Um, and the rash looks a little bit like what would be called Norwegian scabies. I'm afraid to touch that, but I don't know on his back, it looks like Norwegian scabies. But if you look at the picture on the right, he's got all these nodules around his neck, which does not at all look like scabies. In fact, if you look at it like this, and I can't tell what you guys can see, I don't know if you appreciate that those are modules. So we took that picture with, um, actually it was before iPhones, and this, this was way back when. We took with a picture and emailed it to Ernesto. And um, it's kind of fun because uh, when I was tra training, uh, I spent some time with Ernesto where he was my teacher, you know, going around. And so I got this very long email back saying, you know, within minutes, saying, you know, we went over this about a thousand times. <laughs> And of course, I, I hope if anybody's here who's talking knows what it is, I'm going to put my hat is off to you. But he looked at it and he said, those nodules can only be numulus psoriasis. So it turns out it wasn't scabies at all, it was numulus psoriasis. He told us what to do, and within about a week, this is what he looked like, okay? And um, this man now thinks, or after that point, thought we were the greatest doctors that ever existed. So he didn't do anything we say now. <laughs> um, and he was trying to get our grab on that he had seen the, the specialist by by phone and by camera, which was really very cool. So we now have a dedicated camera. Whenever you see somebody with a rash, we can take a picture, it goes right to the derm department, and we can get a diagnosis almost immediately. Um, and the only downside of that, or upside, is that we learned that we often do our own rashes and send it in. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you try to get an appointment. <laughs> So with all this time on the street, um, we learned the same lesson that Partners in Health has learned and that many people that are doing, trying to do care in many third world countries is you can do so much out of the community, but really without a hospital, you can't really improve quality of life that much because you really, you hit a level where you really need the hospital base to be your support. And for the people living on the streets who have cirrhosis, heart failure, they have all these pretty terrible things going on, we needed a hospital base. And just to share with you one thing that I did not understand, and you know, I was shocked. We tried to do our street clinic at Boston City Hospital, Boston Medical Center, and it turns out Boston City, Boston Medical Center, sees by far the most homeless people in the city. Okay, they're you know that's their this fabulous place, and they've done we have a clinic there that is just terrific. However, 
those are the people who live in the shelters, because the shelters are all down there. Rosie's Place, Pine Street, Long Island, which is now, you know, Woods Mall and everything else. So that's where those folks go. But the street folks live around here. Okay, they live on the common, they live downtown, you know, they live uh, in, and they use Mass General, which is really kind of an interesting thing. So we have to do our street clinic if we're going to do one at the MGH. And the hospital in 2001 decided that it was okay if we would try it. And we've been delicately doing that now for the last 15 years. It's, I think it's the only street clinic in the country inside a hospital. Um, and it's a challenge. Uh, this picture is old enough so that you see the old clinics building and not the London, and I refuse to change it because I kind of still like that idea. Um, but our clinic is in the walk-in clinic, the medical walk-in clinic, which is right inside the, the, to the right in the main lobby there. Um, and what the hospital has allowed us to do is have the street folks come on Thursdays. That's our dedicated day for a street clinic. And we have a room downstairs in the, on the Wang lobby floor. And this is that room in Marianne's on nurse taking somebody's vital signs. Um, the hospital gives us coffee and donuts, which is really, and pastries, um, really pretty fabulous. Um, I don't have a thing here, but it, those of you who can tell, when I was showing this picture to the medical students, they pointed out to me that somebody's asleep under the table. I don't know if you can see that. Yes, 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 yes. So that was not, I didn't deliberately do that. That happened to be if I, if I didn't see it when I took the picture. Um, but it's fabulous. So we see about, you know, at first we didn't think anyone would come, but we needed a hospital base to do blood tests and imaging and use the specialty clinics, etc. And so on Thursdays now, we see anywhere from 80 to about 120 street folks who come in straight from the street. They don't have any place to shower, no place to change. So um, my hat is off to the hospital for putting up with that because it's a pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's a colorful but chaotic and um, crew. And it's, it's given us some real insight into what to do. So for example, this is a woman who has terrible diabetes, whose hemoglobin A1C, for those of you who are medical, is 19. <laughs> she lives right here, uh, which is downtown. Those are her all her bags. She sleeps in behind the bags. This is down in the financial district. Never comes, to, comes in, except on the van, we could see her on a Wednesday night and say, look, you come see me on tomorrow morning. I'll be at the clinic. And what we learned is that people do come. They don't care that it's mass general, how much as I thought they did care that it's mass general. <laughs> but they do care that they know the person they're coming to see. So when they, you know, if it's one of our nurse practitioners, sees them outside and say, come see me on, on Thursday, they'll come. So we've had this really interesting thing where we see too, there's too many people. We only have two little exam rooms. We can't possibly take care of them. We've had to do maneuver all sorts of things. But um, the other thing I'd share with you, which is kind of funny, is that you know how flow through the clinic is very much very important? Because when I go to see the doctor, I don't want to be, if I have a 9 o'clock appointment, I'd like to be seen at 9 and be out of there by 9.30. Um, we had the opposite problem. As we tried to see people efficiently, they would get upset and say, look, why don't you see him first? Because they would much rather stay in the environment there, which is kind of warm and therapeutic and it's a community. Um, and they didn't want to be told they now had been seen and they have to leave. So we have the exact opposite. The longer it takes to come through the clinic, the happier it is. We get dinged. We get dinged routinely on all the scales that we're supposed to be using. Um, and it's also the place where we can have. It's just fun, you know. We can have students. As a, we probably can't tell some of those are students, and some of them are some of them are homeless people. Just a lot of fun on Thursdays, and we have a lot of residents. Um, and it becomes a real kind of fun. And these are here, just a couple stories about who comes, right? This is a couple that, one of the few couples we know that just travels the country homeless. And we will get calls from Albuquerque, we'll get it from San Francisco. When they show up there, they need their inhalers or something, and whoever it is will call us and say, can you refill their medications? And they always adopt the, the, the clothing from wherever they've been. I know they had been away for a while. They came in from Nashville. <laughs> this was like one summer day. It was 100 degrees, and they just come in from Nashville, but they had to wear their Nashville stuff. Um, it's really, fair. and um, you know, just to let you know, many years after I took this picture, um, the woman called me, and uh, uh, her name is Geneva, and her husband. They had been living in a tent down in. Uh, in South Carolina, he developed uh, pancreatic cancer and died. And she called to let us know she was under her tent, just to let us know that it happened. And then these are two guys that we were in the clinic. And just to tell you, uh, one of my, you know, one of the things that has taken my breath away through many years is that what you see when you first talk to somebody is rarely what you will learn about them later on. So the first impressions inevitably are wrong when you see folks, and I urge you to think that through. But um, I could tell you the stories of both of these guys, but just the guy on the right, his name is Billy, who um, 
is in, right now he's in the hospital because his kidneys have failed, he's going on dialysis now. Um, but when he was five years old, in 1968, he was caught in the race riots in Upham's Corner, when it was after Martin Luther King had been shot, and, uh, um, and somebody poured gasoline all over him and burned him. And what you can't tell is below his neck, all of his body has been burned. And that was when he was five, and he had like 150 surgeries, he was at the Shriners for about a year and a half. Um, and he lived in a really chaotic family situation, so he never learned how to read or write. And he's been on the streets as long as I've been out there, 1985 till now. Um, and I, you know, he's got diabetes, he's got AIDS, he's got, you know, he's got everything going on. And he still can smile, which I can't quite figure out. But if you saw him out there, you'd look at him and say, come on, what's wrong with this? You know, you just would not understand what he'd been through. And um, he's pretty heroic in the way he, he's actually right now in the ICU at Boston Medical Center dying. Um, and uh, sometimes it's the opposite. This is a, a man who, a man on the right, a man named Richard, and if, I don't know if, I, if you've been here before, I tell this story every once in a while because I love this one. But um, he was on the streets forever. And he was one of those people that when I try to come see him or offer him a sandwich, he would go across the street and go away. He wouldn't go to the pavement near me. And then one night, I don't know what had happened, I was at the night center. And he, uh, when I went up to say hello to him, he said, you know what, I was the youngest teacher ever at the Columbia University. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear this all the time, so I never, we learn now, we always believe everything until proven otherwise, but I was pretty skeptical. Um, and I said, oh yeah, what did you teach? And he told me it was philosophy and English. And I was a philosophy undergrad in, in both graduate school, undergrad and graduate school. And um, so I, he asked me a couple questions and we started talking about philosophy. I wanted to take his blood pressure and his pulse, he wouldn't let me touch anything, no medical stuff, he just wanted to talk philosophy. And so I said, so when were you at Columbia? And he says, oh, I was there from 1949 to 1953 or something like that. And I had done enough philosophy to know that that was a flowering of philosophy back in Columbia at that time. And I don't know if any of you are philosophers, but Trilling and Van Dorn were there. And they were really remarkable uh, philosophers. So I asked them, I figured I'll trick this guy, I'll ask him all about them. Um, and he wouldn't talk about their philosophy. He had issues with their philosophy, but he did tell me all about their mistresses and, <laughs> and all that stuff. And then I said, but you know what? Because uh, I was, I went to college in the 60s, and so, um, you know, Jack Kerouac was kind of this heroic figure in our lives. So I said, um, how about Jack Kerouac? Did you ever meet Jack Kerouac? And he looks at me, and I, I, I think he was wondering whether I was testing him or not. He said, well, you know, Jack was a very dashing young man. And he looked at me, he said, but he was a terribly shallow thinker. Um, which cut me to the quick, because I was trying to say, I think he's great. Um, and, and then, um, and so what happened over time, we would, he would come into the clinic here on Thursdays, and he would only talk philosophy. So I would learn to do my coffee at lunch with him, and then I could talk to him, and then we move on. And so then one day he came in very, very sick. This is after 15 years I had known him. And he, his heart rate was 240, he couldn't breathe. He let me take him into the emergency room and we admitted him upstairs with bad heart failure and a, and a supraventricular tachycardia. Um, and when I brought him upstairs, I was trying to explain to the residents what's going on. I said, I had no idea, but this is what's happening. And they said, well, how long have you known him? And I said, oh, about 15 years. And they said, what's his blood pressure usually? And I said, I don't know, I've never taken it. You know, and you know how residents will look at you when you say something like that. Who is this guy? You know? um, but anyway, I said, but, um, ooh, that must be me, I'm sorry. Uh, I am done. Uh, um, but I, you know, I, I said, I don't know much about him except I talk about philosophy. He says he's the youngest teacher ever at Columbia. So this was in the early days of Google. So they just Google him, you know, and up comes in the New York archives something, comes the letters of Allen Ginsberg to, Richard, to this man. And the letter that I can remember just being stunned by was a letter from, from Ginsberg to Richard saying, thank you so much for spending last weekend on Long Island with me and our friends Neil and Jack. And he said, and I want to particularly thank you for helping me try to convince them that this trip they're planning to San Francisco is insane. <laughs> for those of you who are not in the know, that's the trip, the 22-day trip on which, in which On the Road was written by Jack Kerouac. So it turns out he was the shining young star of the Beat Generation. He was a professor at, or teaching at Columbia at the age of 16. He was teaching English and philosophy. He had this completely ascendant career. Uh, his dad was a judge. They lived on Park Avenue in New York. He had really prominent sisters and brothers. And then he had his first schizophrenic break when he was 19, and it all fell apart. And then he spent 52 years on the streets, not only in Boston, but all over the country, um, basically in flight from his family. And I remember when we, when we finally uh, 
to care of upstairs. We got into the he went to the North End Nursing Home, and we were able to unite it with his family. But the only way he would go to the North End Nursing Home was would it, if I promised to come and pick him up for chowder once every month <laughs> to go to the Union Oyster House, which was his favorite thing to do. So that picture has got lots of meaning to me. Let me show you a, just a couple more, and then I will please, uh, before I bore you to tears, ask some questions here. Um, but this is a lady who really transformed most of what I was thinking. She's a lady that used to call herself a bag lady. I knew her when she lived down in the south, uh, down near South Station on a stoop. And the way she would keep you away from her was she put smelly stuff all around her. And that was her defense mechanism. Okay, that's how she kept you away. It would be rancid milk, off clothes that hadn't been changed in forever. Um, and she was a heavy drinker. And in the early 1990s, she had a blood transfusion, got hepatitis C, and then went on to develop cirrhosis many years later. And the only way she could live would be if she could get a liver transplant. Um, but as you may know, it's very difficult to do that. And when we talked to the transplant surgeons, they said, well, you have to add a minimum to show us that she has six months of residential stability, um, which I think means being at home for six months, um, and that she's so So she came to our McGinnis House, our respite program, which is now 104 beds. And we kept her there for that time. We usually only have people there two to three weeks, but she, we kept her there the whole time. And as she, her name got up to the top of the list, she asked me one day when I walked in if I would take her picture. And remember, this is a lady I'd only seen in rags. She'd been all dressed up, and I don't know how much you can appreciate from where you're sitting, but she's got fingernail polish on, lipstick, um, her eyes got, have some mascara on, she's got her hair up in a bun. Um, she's wearing a really nice dress, I've never seen her in a dress. Um, and she's got flowers in her styrofoam cup next to her bedside table. So I took the picture, I remember printed it out, brought it back to her that afternoon, and I assumed that she was now facing big time surgery, she was afraid of dying, so I, went and I gave her the picture and I said, hey, do you want to talk about death? Is, is anything bothering you with that? She looked at me and she said, oh my goodness, no. Uh, you know, she said, I've faced death out on the streets all my life, that's not a problem. But, she said, I have two daughters. One was three years old, and one was five years old when I last saw them, and that was about 25 years ago. She said, I'm afraid if I die, and my daughters decide they want to find out who their mother was, I wanted to be sure there was a picture of me that was at least presentable enough so that they would feel okay about their mother. And I was like, you know, it just blew me away. Um, and I started, you know, when you think about it, that experience of illness and suffering when you've lost everything. Even your kids don't know where you are, or you, for your your fault or someone else's fault, you're just you're isolated from other people. That loneliness is really profound when you get into a population like this. And when they come into a hospital, you can see how it plays out. They're just scared to death, and they'd much rather leave than than do anything else. Um, and you know, I just to share with you, I worked for a short time in Haiti, and I remember never seeing poverty like I had seen in Haiti. Certainly way worse than I see with the street population who are among our most impoverished people. But in Haiti, when I was taking care of people, the family was always around. Kids were running around. You know, they weren't lonely. If somebody came to the hospital, the same family came with them and fed them. So it was terrible poverty, but it wasn't a lonely poverty. It was a just abject poverty. But if you look at urban homeless folks, it's the loneliest poverty you'll ever want to see. Okay, they just are alone. Um, and that has been one of, the, one of the things that's been really difficult for us to handle. Um, I think I'm going to stop right here, and I could give you, tell you a few more things. What it's about for us now is so many of the people who live out on the street are now able to get into housing under these low threshold permanent supportive housing situations. So what's been really interesting for us, and feels like we've gone back to the future or something, mm -hmm. is that now we spend an awful lot of our time visiting people at home who live for 25 years on the streets. Because when they get into their new apartments, all the skills that work so well when they lived on the streets become utterly useless. And then you have to figure out how to take care of them back home. So we spend about half of our street team time doing these home visits, which on another time I would be happy to talk to you about. But let me stop there if there's any questions.